Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Depends upon where you are in the world. Captain Bill Gustin, the oldest guy in the room from Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department, Miami, Florida. Uh, we're here with our panelists, Mike Dugan, Jason Hovelman, Jimmy Davis, who is our special guest, recently promoted to Captain Jimmy Davis from the Chicago Fire Department, Daryl Liggins from Oakland, California, and Clark Lamping from the Clark County Fire Department, Las Vegas area of Nevada. A little shout out to Key Hose, our friends at Key, Key Combat Ready. Uh, Daryl's going to tell you a little bit about the uh, True ID. Uh, the fire hose industry, and that's all manufacturers, are doing one heck of a job uh, giving us some alternatives rather than just inch and three quarter and two and a half. And he is right up there in the industry uh, with cutting edge technology, and they're never satisfied. They're always looking for a better product. So just uh, my uh, salute to everybody at Key. And I uh, hope everybody is uh, happy and healthy. Um, our topic today, whether it is a Mercury, a Ram, a Blitzfire, today we are talking portable, single inlet, master stream devices, monitors, if you will. Uh, we have two interesting situations here is that we have Jimmy Davis from Chicago, and within the last two months, has issued every engine company uh, in the city a um, RAM monitor. Now that, that particular one is made by Elkhart Brass. But let me get it. From, I'm not advertising anybody's product. And let me tell you, I don't care if it's a Mercury, if it's a RAM, it's a Blitzfire. They're all good. They're all good. So I'm not, we're not going to compare one against the other. They're all good. And they all perform equally. So um, Jimmy's had his engine companies outfitted with these. And then uh, Daryl in Oakland, California, also recently used the engine companies. And the other thing those two guys have in common is that both departments have had a buttload mm -hmm. of fire to baptize these things and put them right to work. So their learning curve is like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's going to be real interesting. Additionally, um, we always like to know what the FDNY is doing. And, and uh, Mike, although retired from captain uh, of a 123 truck, correct, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not sure what they use there, but I, I want to find out. And we're all going to we're going to compare the old way of having a deck done. The old multiversal, which Peter's going to bring up here, is, is that, you know you know which one I'm talking about. The old three inlet multi, the one that mm -hmm. weighs twenty five thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they expect you to take it off the top of the apparatus. That's the yeah. one. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, where where there's uh, uh, each department, twenty five guys went out on disability trying to take it off the top of the apparatus. Yeah, that, that's the one. And then Clark. They've been using theirs out in Clark County quite a bit, and we've got some really impressive video from uh, from Clark. So um, let's uh, let's let's begin uh, without having to do too many, too many introductions because I think everybody knows uh, Jimmy. Since you are our special guest today from Chicago, uh, can you give us a little background and where was the perceived need? What was it replacing? How has it worked? How's the training going? And you take as much time as you want, Jimmy. All right. Yeah. I want to thank you guys too for uh, for having me on the show. Uh, let me put that out there first. So thank you. I've been rather grateful uh, for considering and, and bringing me on uh, today. So I'm rather delighted. You know, the whole purpose of the whole premise was the replacement of existing, just like you said, those old, heavy, antiquated multiversals. In doing so, we're able to standardize our fleet uh, with these RAM XDs, and that's what the department had purchased. They actually to give you a little bit of the background with that. Uh, the department had purchased 99 uh, RAM XDs. Uh, this was through grant front uh, funding from the Homeland Security's Assistant to Firemen's Act. Uh, there's money out there. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive it. So we got 99 of these. 
So the, the, the whole purpose and goal was to outfit every engine company. And we have 96 here in Chicago. And a couple of the squads have them as well. Uh, so we met that goal. But again, the underlying issue is to replace, number one, the, the aging fleet uh, of the monitors or, or multiversals. We had all kinds of them. Now we're pretty much all on the same page. And again, the advantage of that too is that every engine company has the RAM. Um, ours come with, uh, and I, I, I saw Daryl's earlier, uh, we have the one inch, the inch and a quarter and the inch and a half tips. We didn't have that, that uh, leeway to get the inch and three eighths uh, on that. That comes in a stacked uh, faction. Um, August 2020, is when these ramps hit the street. And I tell you what, I think the first moment, all right, they hit the streets, we were putting in them to use. And actually, I was looking uh, at a couple fire pictures here in Chicago, a lot of pictures of that ram being used for exterior defensive operations. Uh, we're very happy uh, as a department with this product and it suits our needs and it gives us the flexibility um, to deploy pretty rapidly a very versatile tool when it comes to managing and, and applying big water on our fires. Jimmy, uh, there are some advantages. Uh, the, the, any of you guys, um, it's, I'm gonna pose this question to everybody. For years, we used a detachable deck gun. Mm. You'd have a pipe, you'd have two spring mounted dogs or detents you put this thing down on the pipe, you, you twist the grip, put it down on the pipe. Every time you charge that thing, I used to like, oh my God, don't let that thing pop off. Mm. Because you see it pop up, up against its stops. And I was never comfortable with that. Now, yeah, the deck gun is going to flow more water than the, than the ram. Jimmy, I think you told me you have a friend of yours that was... Uh, had the ability to flow 500 gallons a minute. Is that right? Uh, it could be done, but it, as I always like to say, follow the manufacturer's uh, oh. okay. uh, recommendations in that. There are some ways, like anything you can do, you know, once you test it, there, there are some fragile areas where you may or may not push the envelope with these things. Uh, but right here, and, and we use in our department uh, literature, uh, about 400 uh, gallons at uh, 80 psi at the tip. Uh, that's what we use as our benchmark. That's your can you exceed water? it? Yes, you can. Uh, but to play it safe, like with everything else, stay within the parameters. Daryl Liggins from Oakland, California. What is your department story? Well, we we we. This was kind of born out of a different need. We are already an organization that uh, is pretty well standardized. Um, and it's been a long road coming. I think I first saw these, uh, you know, over 10 years ago uh, at FDIC when uh, some different manufacturers had these things coming out, um, but, but they weren't really in, in use. Um, we've certainly had fires where, uh, you know, ground based, uh, master streams would have, would have been helpful, but, you know, I just wasn't really seeing that, that used. I think a lot of people may just have been a little, uh, you know, uh, put off at how inefficient it was to set that up. Cause you have to climb up and down the rig and take things apart, set up this base that's in the back of a cabinet. Oh, uh, we had to hook two, three inch lines to it. And then uh, after it was set up, it, it wasn't very mobile. Um, so the operation was slow. It wasn't very safe climbing up and down the apparatus, you know. Um, so um, we got a hold of uh, all the manufacturers. We, we tried all of the different brands. Uh, and like you said, you're really splitting hairs when you're deciding on a brand. It, you know, it comes down to, you know, what can your department, you know, what, how is the rep in that area, what, what's the customer service like, you know, what the pricing or they're all going to be competitive and they're, they're all, you know, rated about the same. So I don't, I don't think you're going wrong with, with any of them, but uh, 
I have a lot of leeway in our organization to try different stuff. Nobody really uh, questions if I'm trying something on my rig. So I was running this on my rig for actually even carrying it to uh, details and things like that. And everybody loved it. So it was a real easy um, sale to the membership. But uh, when I wrote up the proposal, it was really, uh, and, and I have it here, I'm just using it kind of as notes, but uh, we, we had, I said it was a long road coming. Sometimes you just have to wait till all the stars align. And we just happen to have the right people in place to, you know, strike while the iron's hot. And so the points were uh, safety, efficiency, speed, simplicity of design, uh, mobility, and, and versatility. And that's, uh, you know, it, it beat our previous operation and, and all, of, all of those points. So we just put them on the rig in November and they were being used uh, right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and to the point of maybe even almost overused because it was the new toy that everybody was, was trying. We were at a fire uh, not too far from where, where I am right now. We were, uh, and there was literally a, a line of firefighters. And my engineers like, look at everybody's trying to go use the, the new monitor over there. Uh, and so there was a lot of excitement and a, 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 a lot of benefit. And it, it was just a very logical move. It's, it's been nothing but uh, positive uh, in, in almost every respect. If there's anything that came up that's a... Uh, a negative that that came about from actual use is that we've never had a, um, you know, one of the benefits is having a a bail because it's easy to turn on and off, but we've never had it so easy for a firefighter to shut down such large water without any control of the, uh, of the pump operator. And at these large fires, that engine's almost always pumping some two and a half inch hand line or something too. So the pressure discrepancies between this ground monitor and the hand line could be quite large. So if somebody's, when they're shutting that bail down, and I know you you may have a pressure governor that's handling that, or we don't have that. We have pressure relief valves. So it can radically overpressurize that large hand line. If somebody's just shutting down this, uh, you know, 500 GPM uh, master stream. So uh, it, it, it's so easy. It's almost being used like it's a, a large hand line, but we do have to remember to give it the respect of, of a master stream. It's not a hand line, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's Aaron, been a good change for us. We had, we had a similar experience. Sorry for interrupting you, brother, but we had a similar experience with our brand that we're using. Um, it has a safety that has a spring loaded shutoff. So if you just barely bump that, that uh, valve, it automatically shuts itself off. And if you're pumping 400 GPM, that creates one hell of a water hammer and the pump engineer is going to be screaming at you mm-hmm. to stop doing that. So guys were just, just leaning up against it. And if you accidentally bump it, it, it slams itself shut. So we had a, a lot of really pretty significant water hammer with the, with the equipment we're using. Mason Hobelman, I had the uh, honor and clever pre- privilege, privilege to uh, teach in your area for the Muddy Water Fools. I hope you have me back to come cheap. Yeah. And I noticed the way that you <clears throat> are yours, it's in a compartment, but it's, you have a, what, 150 foot or one 100 foot section of three inch already connected. So this thing is out of the compartment and uh, in front of the fire building. You're in a matter of seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I've actually got that video pulled up if you want to share the screen. Um, and, and what we found was, um, can everybody see that? Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead, play it. So here's here's how ours is set up, and basically off of what we need and our staffing and and the way we use it, this was the optimal deployment model for us. And one firefighter handles it. Oh, that's great, man. It, it, what is it? Is that two and a half or three inch there? It's two and a half. Uh huh. Two and a half. And uh, one of the reasons we put two and a half was if we wanted to extend the line, it was easy to do, uh, you know, have a, a handheld nozzle. But uh, for us, it was really, I was a battalion chief probably three or four years ago when we went to this. And 
for me personally, as, as one of the operations uh, chiefs, it was really all about use. You know, we just, because of the bulkiness and the weight, number one, when we used the deck guns, they weren't getting used correctly. Mm. Um, and they were rarely, if, if at all, ever being taken off, you know, for, and most of us would probably agree the, the most, most of the time we need a master stream. Um, we need to come from the underneath side of things. Um, Bingo. And, mm. and, Absolutely. and we're so quick, us included, we had to, we kind of had to break the habit is we're so quick to put up a, a aerial master stream or the deck gun, um, even on a residential garage fire more times than not, you need to come from below. Um, and this afforded us that, and it afforded us to do it quickly. Um, it also afforded us to be able to get uh, like a quick knockdown with that and the other firefighter officer pulling a, uh, a hand line. Uh, so we were able to accomplish a lot in a short amount of time and still be really effective. I think the biggest learning curve for us um, it, it's probably not a problem at a lot of places, but we were really bad about water supply before. Mm. Um, and this really drove home the point that we needed to be very aware um, of our water supply, especially on the Quint, uh, where we've got less capacity. But it's been a really beneficial tool for us. And we, we bought one um, for the house, the, the house one down here. And once everybody got the feel for it, it was an easy sell, like Daryl said, and we've got them on all of our apparatus now. Captain Mike, does FDNY use a version of these? This is the uh, two and a half single inlet uh, portable master stream. Yes, they are. They are, Bill, at the present time. They're using uh, a version of it. They're still kind of working out all of the kinks in the program like Chicago did, but they're trying to get better at it because, as we've all said, the, um, the master streams with the old um, – you know, uh, multiversal, whatever you want to call it, were just, it was, I mean, I remember studying and how the knots had to go, how far out it had to be, how far back the hose had to be laid straight and everything else and the stack tips and, you know, all of that stuff. So doing this is getting it. It's like we've always said with our towel ladders, we bring them down low in our, in our fires where we need it and shoot up into the open up the ceiling space. This is the way to go. And it's, it's very, very, it's vital that we understand this and we train on it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, going way back to my dad's day on the uh, snorkel uh, in Chicago. My dad was on the first operating, articulating boom snorkel. And him and guys like Warren Reddick, uh, uh, Steve's dad, who's a fire alarm office operator, retired and... Um, a uh, avid video and a photographer for fires. If you're watching, hi, Steve. And I've uh, known you since you were 12. So uh, they learned real quick, as did New York City, that you're more effective driving a, a master stream from down below up into the overhead. And that is, to me, one of the biggest drawbacks of the engine mounted deck gun is that you're up in the nosebleed section about 12 feet in the air. If it is a one-story building or a fire and a two-story taxpayer, you want the water down low. Additionally, now I will say, having said this, Jimmy Davis, that video of Engine 98 during your civil disturbances, pulling up at a sporting goods store downtown, with that deck gun, and that is impressive. But in doing so, we do tend to, and I'm not saying that was the case in, with 98's fire, but you do tend to, um, they block the most strategic area for a ladder apparatus. So, um, here's the other thing. you got to stretch three-inch lines or a four- or five-inch line to this behemoth once you get it set up, if you're flowing a thousand gallons a minute, you're not going to need it that long. Then what are you going to do? You got to move it. That's the problem. And that's the beauty with these small devices is maybe they don't flow as much granted, but you can move them. If you've got a fire, for instance, in an attic of a big house, you direct a stream from underneath, you blast through the drywall. If you're not seeing an appreciable reduction in fire, you're hitting an AC unit or a converging roof line, a valley. Something is blocking that stream. Move 
the device. And that's the beauty with the single inlet. But I think we are all in agreement here. In fact, Don Norman says it beautifully. Resist the temptation to come down through a hole that is burned in a roof, a roof that was designed to shed water. Get that water underneath and up into the into the overhead. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that's, we all agree on that. Peter, do you have any pictures or video for us, sir? I don't know if he's up there. I, I do, yeah. Which one do you want to see, Cap? Oh, let's let's look at the photograph, the multiversal. Okay, stand by a second. Let me let me try and share the screen. All right, this ought to be good. Seeing that? Yes, I do. Oh, snap. And oh, there's uh, there's advertising on that picture. There is advertising. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey. I think Elkhart made the same thing. Hey, look at turns in a complete circle. Guys, those things. It, I, I got to imagine. Jimmy, were you ever on the job when they had these? Yeah, Cap. You know, when I got on this, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, I tell you what, I'm still feeling my lower back. Yeah, we had these. Um Yes, and I remember them well, and they needed to be supplied uh, correctly and also secured, or else you're going to take a ride on one of these things. This is the one that require the uh, the multiple tails to try to uh, alleviate yeah. some of that reaction force. Yeah, if you do that. This thing would send you for a ride. Now, so, uh, guys, let's let's be honest here. The portable master stream devices that we're talking mm -hmm. about, they all come with a. Um, a strap and uh, in fact I looked at the other day I think there was a product on the on the market now by one of the manufacturers that has a has it on a pulley uh, like a spring-loaded pulley where you pull it out set it you don't have to tie it off it just locks in that position do you are you required does your department require you to use that strap and if so what do you secure it to so I, I have some things to add on the whole stability issue, Bill. Um, yeah, Ben. So uh, I, I'm not an engineer, so I hope I'm not uh, speaking at a turn, but that original, um, that picture you, you're showing right there, uh, w with the hose, uh, they're trying to add stability to the, uh, to the device and also the way that waterway comes out in two different directions is trying to distribute some of the water's reaction force out in different directions rather than just going straight back and then the more modern version uh, or the improved version of that is like the deck gun where the water went up and it made several 90 degree turns uh prior to you know changing the direction of the water and you had to have a stream shaper and, and this tip uh and that uh, sent water dis uh, distributing it in a lot of different directions, which uh, uh, reduced the amount of reaction force coming back. This monitor, uh, the the stability is uh, a little more involved than it looks like. It looks like, well, why isn't this it's what we did all, all these years? But the waterway makes a very radical turn towards the ground. The, these waterways had a progressive amount of um, stability. If you, the, the more water you're adding, the more it's going to become unstable. In these modern devices, the more water and pressure you're putting in, the more it's driving down into the ground. It's almost like a progressive amount of stability that you're getting um, be, because it's going straight down, making that real uh, tight turn. So uh, it, you know, that's one of the advantages is we don't have to try to bring hose around in a circle and things like that. The other thing I found is just practically speaking, uh, using these straps that come with it, I don't find them personally very usable. Almost all the manufacturers are the same, but a tip I got, I think, from uh, one of these WNYF uh, magazines next to me, the way the FDNY secured what they called the Mercy Multiversal with a rope. I have found that to be a very good option. We do a, uh, you know, a clove hitch over the device and then a half hitch off on the front feet. And then you could just tie it off wherever you want. If you needed it to be 
you know, un, unstaffed or, or unmanned, then that uh, is a is another option you can have just using rope rather than these short straps. Yeah, I th- yeah, and I find that uh, I do find that it, it's like, uh, for lack of a better term, engineer your hydrodynamics. That you are absolutely right. By the way, quiz question for any of our panelists: What do we call the curved? where the two pipes come out and then they go around and then they converge right behind the stream straightener. What do we call that section of piping in there? The answer is ram's horns, at least my part of the world, ram's horn. So um, that's just a little fight. What are you shaking your head for, Jimmy? Because only this crazy old man would remember that crap. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, have you ever heard of a term street jack? Street jack. It no, okay, like, but they haven't heard that, uh, that term, no. What I looked at a, a 1950s version of your training manuals oh, where they were lithographs, beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the guys, they show how to hook up a spanner strap. Uh, and the street jack was the like the predecessor of these it was actually like a it was almost like a like an easel with like three legs on it with an insurance underwriter's pipe you know the real long ones i think they're an inch and a quarter like they use they still use them to test pumps so um jason did you standardize with do you have any of these that are mounted on the tailboard we haven't talked about that i notice a lot of departments do some actually connect them up to their static hose bed. Yeah, we our our specific um, monitor has the capability of being connected on the exterior of the apparatus um, for variable reasons. We have not now. I I do still notice some volunteer departments uh, that definitely do it. Uh, their setup is a little bit different, have longer reach pre connected uh, due to their demographics. Um, And I still have seen um, the tailboard with the old monitor, not quite as old as the one we're looking at on the picture, but taking it off the top of the truck, off that, off that, uh, um, that that connection and sticking it on the back of the tailboard because they use it more often in a, mostly I see this in rural settings um, where they're using that, that uh, deck gun as a ground monitor and they will attach it to the, to the tailboard. Um, up where we're at, we, we chose to keep it in the compartment, uh, mostly because of space and the way that we use it. We may go from, we may connect it in, in different areas. We're not tied to the truck anywhere. All right. Uh, Clark, are you with us still? Peter, we can take that picture down. Yes, sir. Clark, uh, we're going to run your video. Let's change up. Uh, well, before we do that, let me uh, just say hello to everybody out there. Dave Hibben and... Uh, Mark Lighthill from um, Keyhose, uh, they're friends and they're consultants with me, and uh, they've helped us out immeasurably. And uh, but, but really, Daryl, you brought up a really good point. You know, thank God for God bless the USA. We still have capitalism here, and uh, that's American competition. So when you're buying any kind of product, uh, firefighting, whether it's a hose, whether it's uh, any kind of appliance, uh, apparatus. There's so much more than just price or performance as the criteria. Um, I know a, a, a fine product that had a lousy sales rep and, and the guy would never get back with you. So although the product was good, the sales rep wasn't. So it's not just a product. You got to have guys that truly believe in what they're, they're selling and what they've developed. So, uh, and, and key hose is a perfect example of that is that where they are constantly uh, trying to uh, improve their product. Um, now, Clark, we're going to talk about uh, operating off of a standpipe. I know you and Jimmy have both tried that. And um, so I want to see if we can get uh, you and Jimmy to weigh in on operating off of a standpipe with, the, with these devices. 
Um, yeah. So um, what we did in, in my agency, Captain Gustin, is uh, these, these things just showed up. With no training or anything, we bought a new fleet of Pierce apparatus, and we replaced the top-mounted deck gun, the removable deck gun, and they just put these things on the rig, and they never really provided any kind of explanation, any training or anything like that. They might have put the owner's manual on the uh, training webpage or somewhere where we keep all of our other training documents. So what eventually happened is you, you had guys that were underutilizing this piece of equipment. So you go to fires, and you see them setting them up just like they do deck guns. They strictly use them outside, put them up, for, uh, set them and forget them type stuff. And that is they're underutilizing this the piece of equipment is so light and the fact that we can supply it with a two and a half, it is so versatile. This is an interior piece of firefighting equipment. And if I have one firefighter who I can put on this piece of equipment and flow 400 GPM and leave him alone, that's fantastic. That is an efficient way to fight fire. That frees up the rest of the company to do other things. So, um, so that's how we're kind of working on this in Clark County. And we, it's not in our high rise plan yet, but this is absolutely a viable option to hook this up to a standpipe in a high rise. Now in Clark County, the majority of our stuff is uh, hotels. All right. So unless you're going to talk about a convention space or something like that, it's all, it's all hotel rooms. We don't have a lot of high rise commercial like they do in New York and Chicago who could warrant a huge 20,000 square foot room full of cubicles on the 40th floor of a building. We don't have a lot of that. So, in, in Clark County, it's a lot of theory, but it's just something I, we're trying to make people aware of that is a viable option. Um, so, but uh, we do train on this. We do train on this. And then once uh, we have the video, once we do knock down the bulk of the fire, you can take the tip off and you can put your Y on there. And we use apartment loads or, or any kind of inch and three quarter loads. You put your, your inch and three quarters on there with fog nozzles or smooth bores, and then you can finish mopping up the area. So it's a very, very versatile tool. Clark, if there's anything good about commercial center tort core type construction, if there's anything good about the lack of compartmentalization, it is once you get the water up in that plenum up above the ceiling, start tearing down the ceiling, you, you are limited only by the range. There's nothing to stop it other than the range of the, of the stream. Uh, and we've noticed that now. I've never used it in an actual fire, but I think your video is an excellent example of how it gets up into that ceiling space and uh, goes across a very uh, undivided area. Peter, can we play uh, Clark's videos? And and this video, quite possibly the most fun we've ever had in training. When you see how much damage we can do to this building, we had they're going to tear the building down. But yeah, quite possibly the most fun we've ever had when we completely destroyed the interior of this building with one of these monitors. You go ahead and show that for us, Peter. Stand by, I'm trying to trying to figure this one out. All right, and if you can't, we'll 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 try it a, a little bit later. And while he's he's trying to figure yes, it out, right there, uh, right. one one of the things that we uh, look to Clark County for when uh, we're doing this proposal is the stream reach. Um, you know, when it came to two and a half, sometimes people would argue, well, you could use two inch and three quarters and it's the same as like a two and a half, which isn't true because a two and a half has, has a much greater reach and all the waters in one compact area. Uh, so that topic came up with this. Ours is a 500 GPM unit of like, well, what about two two and a halves? Well, two two and a halves take a lot more staffing, but the water's also not coming out at 80 at the tip this monitor is not only double the the gpm as a two and a half it's 500 gpm it's coming out at 80 at the tip so what that leads to is an incredible amount of stream reach an incredible amount of velocity our stream reach is nearly 200 feet mm. i mean the, the it's not even close if you need to stay out of a collapse zone or if you're trying to get water deeper into a large large building, or if you just need that extra punch getting into uh, the plenum space or into high piled stock or whatever. Um, it's not the same as two, two and a half. It's a completely different uh, beast and we got to give that credit. Okay. Ah, oh, there they are. Um, and you notice we manipulate, you manipulate the tip just like you do a two and a half inch hand line. And you really try to break up that stream. This was a, a drop ceiling. 
Um, and yeah, we actually blew completely through the roof decking from underneath as well. Wow. Wow. Yes. Let's try that at Ram too. Yeah. Thanks. Here we go. Okay. That's for, right from the point of view of uh, the, the. Yep. That's the operator. And you notice how just you whip the stream around just like we do with a two and a half inch smoothbore. You break that stream up into large water droplets. Um, so again, this is not a set it and forget it piece of equipment. This is interior of a strip mall that we did this. And look at the amount of damage. This is one one firefighter on one piece of equipment did all that damage by himself. And the range, he's shooting pretty much straight up at this point. I mean, the, the, the actual maneuverability of this tool is amazing. We blew the roof, we blew the roof sheeting off. Yeah, this uh, you know, I, I'm looking at the uh, joists now that I see it on the big screen. That looked like a composite of tubular metal and, uh, and wood. They were parallel cord trusses. Yep, yep, two by fours with uh, tubular metal. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Jimmy, I know that you did some flow tests off of uh, a standpipe. And what was your results? Uh, the caveat uh, to this is it, uh, number one, you, the determination is if your, your infrastructure, your standpipe system is able to support that. We were getting better, better flows better stream when we we're getting outlet pressure at 100 PSI. So static pressure 100, we're sending. By the time we get all said and done, we may have about 50 to 60 at the uh, at the tip. And I'm looking at my notes, uh, just to give you an example. A 150 foot stretch with the two and a half with an inch and a quarter, right? Uh, with the, the outlet pressure of 100, we were getting 58 at the tip and we we're flowing about 350 three gallons per minute. Um, we tried the inch and a half tip, but however, our department uh, for interior firefighting, it led me to my next question for, for Clark, but uh, I'll finish up with this. Uh, using the inch and a half um, with an outlet pressure of 100, end up coming down to 41 pounds at the tip and we're flowing about 428, all right? But again, I think a lot of this is predicated your capabilities on what that standpipe uh, can offer you. Now here in the city, um, it's 65 PSI. We haven't uh, done the, the after 1993, uh, which is 100 PSI. So we have buildings here in this, this city is you're gonna get 65. Uh, well, there are built- on the, on the other hand though, both you and Captain Mike are in jurisdictions that you do not use pressure reducing valves. Am I correct? Correct, uh, Kev. We do not use it. All our systems are zoned and they're hydraulically calculated. That would be the terminology where one zone will not exceed 200 PSI. Okay, but we're you can also, feel we're, Go ahead, Mike. We're also zoned because some of these ultra high rise buildings, we're zoned, our standpipes are broken down. They can't be more than 300 feet high. They have to have their own independent pump and water supply, depending on them. Some of the buildings that we've now gotten built in, in Manhattan have four zones because they're so tall. Four separate standpipe. Uh, the We can't call them Siamese anymore because it's not politically correct. The fire department connections, the FDCs. We have four separate standpipe FDCs. So, again, if you're in a jurisdiction like New York, Chicago, and I don't know if Las Vegas breaks them down by our, our height because of the, again, the friction loss going up and everything else in the pumpers being able to get the water up there are 300 foot. So you've got some of these buildings, um, the one on Park Avenue, as, as it's known, the middle finger to Manhattan, the tall high rise building that's 98 stories. Okay. They have to have four standpipe zones. So you have to have the ability to get that water up there. And each zone has to be, as Jimmy said, hydraulically figured out, has to have its own automatic water supply, has to have a fire pump to keep the pressures up there. Because our pumpers are not going to be able to pump that water all the way up that. There's no way we can do that. We need the piping. The whole zones have to be fixed. And the problem is going to be, again, in some of our municipalities, coming over pressurizing the standpipe, which I have done one time. We overpressured it. I don't even think we really overpressured it, but we used it. The standpipe broke and we filled the basement of the project building up and the guys up on the uh, 14th floor had no water. And they were standing there, what's going on? And finally somebody came over and said, 
Uh, hey, is there any reason you guys are filling up the basement next door? And thank God the chauffeur knew what he was doing and knew what a post indicator valve was, went over and shut that off. And now that standpipe, that whole building, because they were interconnected, is shut off. And now all of a sudden we got more water than we know what to do with. And the guys are riding it like the sleigh ride. Hmm. Mike, uh, Jack Murphy, a mutual friend, uh, mm-hmm. sent us a... Um uh, an article about uh, one of those buildings on Park Avenue where they they have some problems. Now, Mike, and you call it the middle finger. I mean, it, it does kind of look strange. I mean, it looks like the Eiffel Tower is so straight or the Washington Monument, except taller. Um, Mike, is each floor its own residence, one residence per floor? In that specific building, in that specific building, uh, the first 20 floors are commercial. Then from 21 to, it's 98 stories, from 21 to, I think it's 74, might be 75, are two apartments per floor. And then from like the 75th floor to the 98th floor is one apartment per floor. It, it, so. What is your, where do you plan on laying out the hose since you don't have a hallway to lay it out? You don't have a hallway on the floor below, really. Where are well, you going to lay it? Look, there has to be. I pose that question to all you guys. There has to be a stairway. You're going to use the stairway. You can't go to the fire floor. So we're usually going to go to two floors below and and stage there, in this building, and use the stairway. And if we have to take apartment doors on other apartments to get into it, and again, it's unfortunate, but our building codes have not caught up to our fire codes, and they are, they do not mix together very well. We're putting people, I mean, you and I have talked about it, Bill, on a 98th floor of a building, Get just getting the person down. We tell them don't use the elevators, okay? If somebody had to walk down those 98 floors to get to the lobby to see us, they'd be there for a week, okay? So, again, you know, now we have the new um, appendices in the code about the occupant evacuation elevators and all of the other stuff that's coming in there. But we're, the fire service is playing catch up on these things. And we have to be aware of what we are allowing to go up there and how we have to plan for this. I yep. mean, it's going to be a tough fight. It is. And, and Mike, this does have a lot to do with, with the FDNY. Um, and again, it has nothing to do with portable monitors, but, um, I see a lot of stories about, uh, businesses closing, businesses, uh, shut down now, uh, people working from home, uh, that has to, uh, have an adverse impact on the, on the whole infrastructure. Bill, um, I teach in the city of New York for a school that teaches fire safety directors in buildings. And our office is on 8th Avenue and 34th Street. No one has been in our office since last March, almost a year, okay, in our office, in our school, all right? And I talked to a friend of mine whose daughter just moved into Manhattan. In Manhattan, she got five months free rent in an apartment. So she's getting half a year. So they've cut the rent in half for one year just to get people into these apartments. There are places in there now. I mean, um, there are great places. I just heard uh, the other day uh, that uh, in, at FDIC, the Clad is gone. Uh, Clad, yeah. Ike, and, Ike and Jonesy's is gone. Slippery Noodle is closed. All of these iconic places that firemen congregated in uh, a, another city, Indianapolis, they're gone because again they can't pay that rent they can't pay that they don't have any money coming in how are they going to do this this is going to impact every one of our cities throughout the 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 area okay our businesses our local economy and i think about it all the time for being in that school in new york city where i taught i knew the guy at the coffee stand i knew the guy where i bought my paper I knew all of these guys that are in there. There's nobody there anymore. That's the place that I went to get my lunch. Um, the, the salad bar doesn't exist. They're gone. So what happened to all of these places and all of these people? I think our economies, I mean, 
I hate to say it, but I think we're going to go back to the fire duty that we're going to see because of all of these places being abandoned, left the way they are, and everything else. And there was also, if you go on the FDNY's Facebook page a while back, there was a guy they found in Brooklyn, New York, and this is a little off topic, but he was storing 20-pound propane cylinders mm. for uh, the outdoor heaters in a, just a storefront, 904 cylinders stored in a storefront, 904 cylinders full of propane, 20 pounders, okay, do the math. OK, just stored. This is happening in other places and for the outdoor heaters and everything else. This is happening. Um, the rules on the propane storage, the rules on the storage of the alcohol sanitizer. The FDLY said, you know, you've got to have if you store more than a certain um, amount of gallons of, F of, uh, of the hand sanitizer, the alcohol based hand sanitizer, you've got to have somebody who has a certificate of fitness. Somebody who knows what they're doing for storing this. Okay. And again, it's going to be very interesting to see where all of this leads us. I just saw Mike Cornelius Sr. Uh, on the hashtag. Uh, Mike, if you are the developer of the uh, Speed Swivel, uh, I'm a huge advocate, as you know, and it is a wonderful device. And, you know, Mike's my friend, and I'm going to give him a plug. He's from uh, Phoenix, if it's the same Mike Cornelius that I know. And uh, we have a huge problem, as I'm sure you do, Captain Mike, with people stealing the female swivels from fire department connections. And, and Mike, uh, he has no competition, so I can give him a plug. Has a device that engages the bearing race, if you will, uh, of the fire department connection, you spin that on. Because I got, especially here, guys, if we've got PRVs, pressure reducing valves, on the first floor of the standpipe outlet, we cannot use the first floor outlet as an inlet, as you and I have talked about. And also, I learned from a wise old sage charge the line before you open the first floor outlet uh, so you don't. Drop the pressure. Yeah, and that wise old sage is right there. Uh, he's wise. He's old. I don't know how sage he is, but he is wise wise and old. I'm but, more uh, rosemary than sage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Guys, it is our but, response. Bill, Bill, yeah, go ahead, Bill, They all know what we're talking about when I talked about that with you. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. When you charge the standpipe if you're using the first floor to charge an outlet if you do not have the hose charged and you open up that first floor outlet you are going to cause a drop in pressure inside the entire building opening it up and jimmy's shaking his head yep. and i've seen it happen you have to charge that line and then open up that outlet so that you are now overcoming that head pressure if you open up that line back to that pumper Mm -hmm. You are filling that back in if that valve, if that clapper is not working, which half the time they're not working. So you have to charge that hose line first before you open that valve or else you're going to have a drop of pressure. And if brothers and sisters upstairs making a push are all of a sudden going to have a limp hose in their hand and being what the hell just happened. Wow. OK. Jason Hovelman. Uh, what have you guys been doing with the, uh, as far as any hands-on training uh, during this uh, pandemic that we're, we're in, as far as limiting personnel, limiting the amount of activities, or maybe n limiting nothing at all? We, uh, we've kept it all in-house, uh, mostly single company. Uh, so we, we've not done anything mutual aid in a long time. Now, this week or next week, uh, they're starting, of course, weather, weather permitting for outdoor stuff, but... Um, it's all been company level and, and quite honestly, they've, uh, they've done a really good job getting out on their own when the opportunities presented itself. And, um, they've, uh, we actually, to Mike's point in regards to fire duty, we had a significant increase of fires last year in 2020. Uh, it was noticeable, uh, very noticeable and, and rescues for that matter. Um, 
I mean, we're not in New York or, or Chicago by any means, but, but we've had a, we had a busy year last year. Um, and, um, the, that single company training really since April, uh, has really paid off for them. Um, I, I'd say the one benefit to them was that they were able to really get, uh, intimate and refine some of the basic fundamental things like water supply, setting some time benchmarks for getting a, a hydrant hooked up and, 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 and they can do multi-company, just not multi-jurisdictional. Uh, if that makes sense. And, and one point I want to make, and I put it in the comments, uh, kind of it shows it with Clark's video is, uh, and this is kind of for the low staff, maybe rural departments, but I've seen this, uh, these, these uh, one person monitors work really good for jam packed tractor trailer fires uh, because of that reach mm-hmm. and penetration that it provides you um, in a manageable, in a manageable uh, appliance. Um, you just open those back doors and you fire that thing up and it does an incredible job. Mark, you were telling me, remember that tractor trailer you were telling me about? Yeah. Yeah. That was a mess right what on the, the side of the highway. That? What the hell was that, that thing again? It was uh, individual cakes. Like the, you go to you get the four, four muffins yeah. or four brownies or something, cellophane packages, a 53 foot trailer packed floor to ceiling with those things and we started putting water on it and turned back into dough and goop and it, it smelled horrendous we had to have a loader come out we couldn't even access we couldn't we tried everything we couldn't get water from the back to the front the dot showed up with a loader and we had the loader just rip the fiberglass side completely down rip it completely off the side so we're looking at all the product and that's how we actually fought the fire but we had large pallets of the stuff then collapsing down on us so we had a, we had a set up a collapse zone so you don't get killed by cake and brownies right <laughs> be a hell of a thing to tell someone's widow oh he died saving brownies <laughs> hey we're just about ready to wrap this up i want to uh want to give a shout out to some of my buddies uh to Ricky, Ricky Stevens, who's uh, has set up. I don't usually look this good, but he's got this lighting. You know, at the risk of now, nah, I'll screw it up. He's got this kind of light that he can change. Um, no, no hard stop, gentlemen. Well, yeah, but I gotta go back to work. Unlike you guys, I gotta go back to work. Jimmy, I gotta tell you, brother, this was like the last. SOP committee meeting for our high rise SOP. Now we've got a lot of touches to do on it. Uh, you know, as I've told you and I've told Clark and I've also told Dan Shaw, who's not with us today, that I've plagiarized the doggy doo doo out of Clark County, Chicago's and uh, well, of course, FDNY's and Northern Virginia regional a high-rise plan because there's very few fire departments in the United States that can handle a high-rise of any significance by themselves. We're going to have to play with your uh, departments. And I, I know that uh, Bowman is a big leader in uh, in his area as far as working with other departments and, and training with other departments. Um, but uh, you know, Since we... Since yes, we sir. don't have a, uh, we don't have a hard stop. Keep going, uh, brother. Well, uh, I'd be remiss to not uh, talk about some of the the details we we had to consider, uh, or or whoever's out there considering one of these devices, or True ID, like you talked about in the in the beginning of this this because uh, those both uh, there's there's a lot of consideration. So it's one of those things you you can't do what the neighbor neighbor does. Um, and we've, we've seen an increase in fires too, but mainly uh, homeless encampments. The homeless problem here is destroying our city. It's killing our city. We have, I don't remember RV fires being a thing, and now they're a daily occurrence. Encampment fires are several times a day. So we're using that deck gun. We're using that ram uh, quite a bit. And um, anyway... Uh, I digress. Um, one of the, uh, the way our rig is set up is our two and a half is only a hand line. So if your department is using this two and a half as an intermediate size line to supply buildings and things like that, I would, I would take a real, you know, a, a caution with something like true, 
uh, ID or two and a quarter because those are really trying to improve hand line operations, but can increase the, the you know a, a, a reduction in potential volume or an increase in pump pressures needed for some of the, the heavier lifting like master streams and things like that. Now, since our two and a half is only a hand line, we're taking a real close look at the two and a quarter. It's on, on my rig right now. We're running with it and it's been nothing but beneficial. Um, does take a little bit more pressure, uh, but I found that to be a benefit since usually two and a half isn't charged. It's usually supercharged. Um, now, when it comes to the, to the Ram, we have a, we have three inch and three inch does the heavy lifting uh you know for for master streams and we're already accustomed to that and we have you know a, a static load of inch and three quarter a static load of two and a half and then our static bed of three inch so it made it very clean to implement this this ram one firefighter sets it up and then the the company uh stretches three inch to where it was set up and it, it's like a third size hand line and since we are supplying it with three inch, we, um, that's why we went with a one and three eighths tip rather than the uh, stack tips because uh, it's already set up. We, we can get 500 GPM. Yeah. The manufacturer's recommendation was 500. So, uh, but, but I will say everybody had to get trained on the friction losses needed for two and a half because all of our uh, surrounding agencies have two and a half, and we we often go into some of their their areas. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Talk us out to your apparatus, Daryl, and let's take a look at your hose bed. I would love to. They're covering me right now, and they just oh. they just took a run. Okay. But, uh, yeah, but um, I'll have to. Uh, yeah, maybe send you a photo so we can show that sometime. But you know, and I think it, what we're going to start doing is um, we're going to start doing these like these virtual walk arounds. Uh, for all of us, like when we get a new rig or a specialized rig or something, because uh, all us little boys like our toys and uh, all the other little boys that are watching would, uh, I've always been fascinated with other fire departments, hose beds, uh, in uh, the, the way that they're configured and why they are configured that way. Uh, Chicago, of course, is a... Uh, Real good example of that. Got a pretty new station, uh, Errol? No, this is, uh, let me see here, 1959. Let me right. flip my camera around. Okay. Engine 13, 1959. And I'll kind of close it with this, okay? God bless America. Amen. These are first world problems we're talking about. And our job is very important. Right across the street here from my station, that's the ghost ship. We lost 36 people in that building right there. Our last fi house fire was right there. You never know when something is going to strike close to your firehouse. Okay, we always have to be prepared. Um, and, you know, training is going to be the key and, you know... Uh, we can't we can't overtrain. Some people say you're a fire geek or whatever, but what you are is you're you're professional. Anybody listening to this right now is a professional, and they're trying to improve themselves or their organization. So thank you guys for listening. Uh, we thank you, Daryl, and I think that's how we're going to wrap it up because I don't think we can top that, Daryl. And uh, till next month, Chief Hovelman, Pete, off in the uh, background, you don't see him. Jimmy, thanks so much for being our special guest. Captain Mike, thank you as always for keeping me honest and on point. Clark, my brother, brother, my brother. Till next month. And this is Bill Gustin from Miami Dade, hoping everybody out there remains healthy and happy. God bless until next month.